So the other day on this channel, I interviewed Professor Brad Thompson, and we talked about public schools and the need to abolish public schools. And he briefly mentioned in passing that socialization is one of those things people assume is a desirable goal, that everybody accepts at face value their kids need to be socialized. And there seems to be a belief amongst most parents that socialization is something that should happen during the formal education process, in other words, at school. And that's why people ask when you say, I'm homeschooling, but what about socialization? Or if you suggest they should homeschool, but what about socialization? I also think for some people they're asking, how do you keep your kids from being weird? But let's assume they mostly mean, how will my kids be socialized? Well, today on this channel, I'm going to dive a little deeper into socialization and question the premise that it's a net good and that it should be done by schools. Okay, what is the definition of socialization? According to Merriam-Webster, the process beginning during childhood by which individuals acquire the values, habits, and attitudes of a society. That's interesting. I don't see any mention of school there. Just the process beginning during childhood by which individuals acquire the values, habits, and attitudes of a society. Do you think that a government-run school, or really any school, where the teachers are strangers, the administrators are strangers, and they don't love your child, do you think that's the proper place to make sure that your child acquires the values, habits, and attitudes they should have to function in society? Do you think they're better able to do that than you are? Interesting. And then we also have social interaction with others. This would be the socializing part of socialization, this teaching how to socialize. Do kids get a lot of time during school to actually socialize? And to the extent they do, let's say during recess or gathering before class or after class or before school or after school, is that a safe environment for them to figure out who they have things in common with and who they don't. I mean, does that does that really happen automatically or are they navigating some, um, shall we say, obstacles and risks associated with that, especially lately? I'm just asking. I mean, these are questions I think you should ask. I think as we dive into this topic, you should sit back and put yourself in your child's shoes at whatever age they are and say, Hmm, when I was this age, how was that social life for me in school? Now, perhaps you were one of those popular kids who just had an easy time making friends and all that. But let's say you weren't. Did, did the school help you? Did they come in and say, hey, let, let's help you out. Let, let's help you learn how to get along with other people in a, in a way that actually improves your situation? Or were you kind of on your own? And when you went home, did you feel like you were able to explain to your parents what you were going through all day or did you feel a little bit of alienation because they weren't there and they just don't know and they don't understand? And if you tried to explain it to them, did you hear sometimes, well, you just got to put yourself out there? Or conversely, did you hear, well, you need to settle down and be nice to, nicer to people even though they weren't there to see what was going on and they don't know what the little groups are and cliques are and things like that that define the social structure at your school. And that's just the social structure. I'm not talking about the socialization process in the class, the teaching that goes on in the class about how to behave in society, what values you should have. Do you think your children should learn their values from their peers or from you? Do you think they should learn habits from their peers or from you? I mean, these are questions you should ask. If you're walking around saying to people who are already homeschooling, but what about socialization? I hope they fire back, what about it? How's that working out for you? Do you feel like you have to work against the values being taught by your kids' peers or teachers? Do you feel like you're walking into a minefield just starting a conversation with your child? Is your child being bullied? Do they have great manners with adults? 
are you really like proud to take them places and you know have them introduce themselves and talk to other people of all different ages do they make eye contact I mean these are questions I don't think enough parents ask themselves or each other so that's why I'm putting it out there you can hate me for it, but there it is. But what I really want to do is talk more about the specific values and habits that are being taught right now in our schools, because that is socialization as it's going on. If you have this illusion that socialization is confined to the conversations between the peers, between your, your child and, and their friends, you're, you're wrong. The school, the teachers, the adults in the building are actively socializing your child. They are teaching your child a value set what's important, not just in terms of human interaction, but what is important to value in life and on this planet. And currently, one of the things they're being taught is that the nuclear family should not be the center of their life. That in fact, the nuclear family may very well be wrong and should be questioned. And they should instead look to the state, their school, their teachers, their peers, people who write important books that they're given to read. Those people, the experts, are the ones they should turn to for their values. As far as their habits go, they're not really being discouraged from developing really bad ones. I don't see any effort whatsoever at any school, including increasingly private schools, they used to do this, but mm, not so much anymore, to teach executive functions and to reinforce them. Time management, planning, work ethic, neatness, proper spelling, proper grammar. Um, and these are things you would carry into any job. Politeness, looking people in the eye, standing up straight, having self-respect, not shouting over people, not interrupting people, not talking down to people, not being condescending, not being snarky, not being rude. These, these things go on every day at school. It's perfectly okay because they value group work over individual achievement. So if you put people in little bowl sessions sitting around at tables and then the teacher just mills about looking over their shoulder every so often, what's going on at the table? Is the teacher really interacting in that conversation? Are they learning how to talk to each other in a way that's remotely respectful? Well, I can tell you the answer is no. I used to volunteer in my kids' schools, and I would do some of that, and I would listen carefully to how they spoke to each other. And they would call each other dummy and stupid, dumbass sometimes, shithead. I mean, the teacher's right there. If the teacher heard, if it was impossible to claim the teacher hadn't heard, the teacher might say, hey, hey, none of that. But when I was a kid, that would be all right, you're going to the principal's office or that's, you know, some kind of, some kind of correction. We don't speak that way to other people. But here it's just like, hey, 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 you know, tongue down, keep it quiet. Don't say it so loud. Some teachers curse. And you might think, well, don't be so, such an old fuddy-duddy and such a prude. Really? Well, that, that's socialization. Your child is not learning a filter except from you at home. But you may have to overcome that. So if your kid is coming home and calling you by your first name or talking down to you or being disrespectful to you, that's their socialization in action. That's what's gone on at school. So, you know, maybe you want to think about whether socialization is something you want the government school to do. Do they have your best interest at heart or your kid? I would argue they don't. But that's our government. Let's take a look at some other governments and what they thought of socialization in the past. I want you to listen for a couple of things. I want you to listen for things that sound familiar to today. And I want you to be honest about it. I want you to seriously consider whether you hear anything that sounds familiar. So first, we're going to take a look at socialization in Nazi Germany. In his book, Mein Kampf, written in the 1920s, Hitler said, whoever has the youth has the future. 
Even before they came to power in 1933, Nazi leaders had begun to organize groups that would train young people according to Nazi principles. By 1936, all Aryan children in Germany over the age of six were required to join a Nazi youth group. At 10, boys were initiated into the young folk, young people, and at 14, they were promoted to the Hitler Youth. Their sisters joined the young middle, young girls, and were later promoted to the League of German Girls. Hitler hoped that these young people will learn nothing else but how to think German and act German, and they will never be free again, not in their whole lives. And you might think, well, Deb, they're not saying anything like that. No, you're correct. They're not quite that explicit yet. But we are hearing things like do the work and um, agents of change, action civics. Our kids are being taught to um, be activists as young as seven, eight years old, to save the planet, to speak out, to fight. They're being told that what is is bad. They need to deconstruct, decenter, critique what is. They don't know what is in any detail. They don't know how it got that way. They don't know why it is that way. They just know they're supposed to critique it. They're supposed to be critical of it. That's the proper way of thinking. That's the set of values they're supposed to have. But it's really not that different. Do the work. Are you free? If you say, I don't want to do the work, this work, I'm going to do my own work. I'm going to do my own personal work off in my own personal corner to advance my own personal agenda. <gasps> Selfish. Are you free if you cannot say no without being called names? See, right now they're just calling you names. That's where we are now. But we're already referring to people who won't get a certain thing stuck in their arm as the unvaccinated. Like it's a group of people, the unclean. How far away are we from talking about kids who want to achieve as individuals as the uncooperative or the selfish, the unmotivated, the unpick a word, okay? Probably not that far. And that means you're not free. When you can't say no without negative repercussions, you are not free. Gabrielle Clark's son could not say no. He was not able to say, I'm not participating in the survey. I'm not telling you what my you know, race, my gender, my sexuality, my religion, I am not having this conversation. I disagree with what you're saying. And he was failed. He failed his civics class. So you may not see the similarity. I do. They're just honest about it. All right, let's look at what Marx and Engels think about the family, since everybody's so pro-Marx now. Yeah, go read Teen Vogue. I'll tell you all about it. For Marx and Engels, the traditional bourgeois child-rearing family was doomed. Following the successful proletarian revolution, children would be housed, socialized, and educated by public organizations. In actual practice, most Soviet leaders since the revolution have not regarded the family and early childhood as high priority items for government attention, governmental attention, and even those who have found it difficult to make an impact. This resistance appears to be related to the extremely high cost of enlarging programs affecting the family and early childhood enough to have a definitive impact and to the difficulty of assessing the results. The current Soviet leadership has not appeared interested in these matters and has left policy assessment and control up to educational specialists who have been, become increasingly critical of the results of Soviet child rearing. One concrete result is that the present level of overt early childhood socialization is probably at its lowest point in Soviet history. So... They were having trouble. It was really hard because they had to leave it up to the education specialist and it was too expensive and too big and, you know, they had trouble. But they were trying. They were trying really hard. In fact, I have this book from back when schools were trying to socialize me differently. Better, in my opinion, but still socializing. What You Should Know About Communism and Why. Yeah, this little, this little ditty. Uh, this edition, this is a teacher edition, actually revised... January of 1964, I was in school in the 70s and elementary and, and 80s in high school. But this is interesting. It says um, under chapter 11, training the minds of youth. This chapter together with chapter 12 presents what are probably the most vital understandings that young people must grasp at their study of communism. So back then, it was really important in 1964 to teach students to grasp the importance of you know understanding communism. And some of you are probably saying, that's really important. They should have done that. Yeah, they should have. But what if 
in working so hard to drum into their minds about communism, they created rebellion on the parts of students who wondered why are we not hearing anything negative about home? Remember, it's still, they're still indoctrinating. If the kids can't come to this on their own at all, if they aren't, and I don't mean like magically come to it. I mean, if you aren't giving them the original writings of Marx and the original writings of our founders or something and then saying, let's compare and contrast. Where do you think people have more freedom? Where do you think there's more tyranny, et cetera? If they're not arriving at those ideas through reason, forming their own concepts, you are technically indoctrinating. I may prefer the ideas that you are indoctrinating, but you're still indoctrinating. Let's be honest about it, okay? And the problem is, when you teach someone by indoctrination, all you get is a parrot. You don't get someone who actually understands the why and the how of what you're saying. And the only upside is that being indoctrinated into classical liberal values isn't going to result in violence. It's really not. But it's also not going to really result in a lot of loyalty and commitment to those values either. It, it's just sort of knee-jerk reflexive, you know, this is what I believe because I was taught this. So if somebody comes along and you're feeling disaffected and you're not feeling like life is working out for you and they tell you, ah, oh, the reason is, and here's some marks, you have nothing to, you have no way to resist it. You were never taught that in a, in a comparative way. You didn't understand why you were being taught the values. So they take pl points to emphasize. Communist recognition that, con that controlling the education of the young is the best means of developing dedicated followers of communism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they thought. Let's not turn around and do the same thing in terms of we don't want followers of classical liberalism. We want people who actually believe it, like themselves, have arrived at those conclusions. So even though we can all look at this book and go, they used to teach us about communism. That's a plus. Big plus. Okay? We don't do that anymore. We've red-watched the curriculum. We've got Zinism now. Um, this is not the antidote to what we have now. The antidote to what we have now is more having our kids do like what my high school student is doing. Reading John Locke, reading Montesquieu, reading Bacon, reading these thinkers. And she's read some Marx and Engels and so forth. And then comparing and contrasting them. Comparing the ideas. Let these ideas be dissected and discussed with an adult guide who can ask the right questions. So the, the kids arrive using reason, they will arrive at, in my opinion, the conclusion that you have more human liberty following the classical liberal model than following Marxism. But if you don't teach it that way, it won't be in their, in their bones. They, like they won't really believe it the way they need to. And the last example I'm going to share with you is, um, this is from a book by a Frenchman. It's called Last Exit to Utopia. The Survival of Socialism in, post, in a Post-Soviet Era. If you're curious as to why <laughs> it has survived so long, this would be a good one to pick up. Uh, it's too long and too deep for me to answer that question for you here in this short video, but I'm gonna just read something that uh, he says, and this is by Jean-Francois Revel, okay? Something he writes here. He says, in 1997, I published a rather modest editorial titled Wrecking Our Schools. It didn't broach any original themes. For years, lamentations had been heard from every side about the constant lowering of standards, about the ever-increasing illiteracy and classroom violence, and about what has been prudishly euphemized as academic failure, apparently a kind of natural catastrophe with no connection whatsoever to the methods followed or imposed by those in charge of France's public education. This is France. This is, you know, another country. But it's going to sound familiar, I bet. The day after my editorial came out, I received a missive under the letterhead of the Ministry of National Education, signed by one Claude Thelot, Director of Evaluation and Forecasting. While ironically addressing me as Monsieur l'Académicien and Cher Maître, this consequential personage deigned to notify me that my piece displayed a rare intellectual poverty and was, in a word, unfortunate. Obligingly, the magnanimous director was entirely at my disposal to furnish me with basic knowledge about our secondary school system that I was clearly lacking. Yet the very next week, the press published a study by the same government, Department for Evaluation and Forecasting, that revealed, among other appalling facts, that 35% of students entering CITSIEM, roughly equivalent to sixth grade in America, have little reading comprehension and that 9% do not even know the alphabet. 
Looking over these widely reported and devastating statistics, I couldn't help but ask myself if Monsieur Thello had done likewise. Was he merely an idiot? Self-confessed, obviously, since the very same bureaucracy he presided over had corroborated my assertions. Or was he just a hopelessly lazy individual who couldn't even be bothered to glance at his agency reports? I rejected these hypotheses and came around to the view that Thillot's, Thillot's, argu Thillot's arrogant blindness was due to the omnipotence of ideology, which had completely parasitized his mind. Just like the apparatchiks of yesteryear who couldn't imagine that the low yields of Soviet agriculture were the inevitable result of collectivization, our educational bureaucrats are incapable of grasping that the ideological treatment they have been inflicting on French schools for 30 years could be responsible for their breakdown. If decades of practice yield the opposite of the intended result, the ideologue can never accept this as proof that his principles could be wrong or his methods faulty. The educational fiasco is a good example of an often encountered phenomenon of that totalitarian sector in the heart of an otherwise democratic society. So there you have it. You want socialization by totalitarians. And you might think, but we're a democratic society, Deb. No, but the school system is totalitarian. It is because it indoctrinates and it always was because even when it was teaching this, it was teaching it as you must believe this. This is true. They just so happen to be more right than wrong, but not for the right reasons. And remember, we did get the, you know, McCarthyism and other things that caused a backlash, didn't it? Didn't it cause a backlash? Didn't we have the 60s? Didn't we have rebelliousness? Didn't we have people embracing Marxism purely because it was forbidden? I would bet. Didn't we have people who could easily sell the idea that everything wrong with the country, and there was plenty still wrong, was a function of classical liberalism? It had failed, and we needed a Marxist revolution. And that's what they're still pushing, by the way. They never went away. They just went into the universities, and they started teaching from the top down. It's so never went away. Their rebellion has been ongoing. It's just been a very different kind of rebellion, a different kind of revolution, an intellectual and a cultural revolution. And they learned, whereas we classical liberals did not, they learned from the mistakes of Mao and Stalin and Hitler, and they went about it more slowly, but they were committed. And now, here we are, we got here. We got to where we are today because too many people said, but what about socialization? and trusted the state to do it. And we're not going to get out of this mess. We are not going to get out of this mess quickly, and we're not going to get out of this mess easily. There's no easy way out. It took at least, well, gosh, at least 50 years, probably more like 100, but at least 50 years to get to this point. I hope it takes a lot less than that to get out, but we got to where we are because the people who are now making decisions the adults in power making decisions about everything from our economy to our health to our children for us who don't care about our input and who are telling us things like the time for voluntary you know, choice is over. We tried it your way and it doesn't work and you don't get to choose anymore about our health are going to be moving on to education before too long. But if we as parents pull our kids out of this totalitarian system while we still have the exit door unlocked, we stand a chance at least to rescue our kids, to rescue their minds and begin to teach them reason. So if they get captured again, if they're dragged back in at some point, they've at least had some instruction in thinking and they can resist. But if they stay where they are and you try to undo that work in a few hours a day, I'm sorry to tell you, you will fail. You will fail because they're not done. They're not done. As crazy as things seem now, they want universal preschool. They want to make college free and encourage everyone to go. And by free, I mean all of us will be slaving away all day and probably well into the night to pay for it. And then so will they at some point because money will run out. But that will soon become just lower quality higher indoctrination, college or university, and getting through to your kids will become harder and harder and harder. So it seems all fine now. It's like, eh, it's bad, but it's not that bad. Actually, it is really that bad. But 
this is what it will turn into. This is what it will turn into. And I know some of you out there think I'm an extremist histrionic loon, according to one of you. But I wear that proudly. I wear that badge proudly. I'm not histrionic, though. But according to most, I am an extremist. Because the view I hold is not common. We need to abolish the schools. But we're not going to abolish them while our kids are still in them. So leave. Okay? And if you found this useful, helpful, enlightening, inspiring, I hope you will smash that like button. Consider subscribing to the channel, joining my locals community. And that's the video.